I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Dave Goulson who is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex. Dave is also the founder of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and author of three books, the most recent of which is The Garden Jungle or Gardening to Save the Planet. I feel like this episode follows on perfectly from last week's podcast with Chris Williams of Edible Culture because what Dave says really reinforces the ethos behind that nursery. And it also fits in with something that's been really bothering me, which is the whole popularity of wildlife gardens. Because as you'll hear from the start of the interview, wildlife gardens will only do good if you source your plants from the right place. If you don't, you're actually doing more harm than good. We did work a couple of years ago on pesticides in garden centre plants, Mm. particularly ones being sold as bee friendly or perfect for pollinators, as the RHS logo. And the RHS basically allow any garden centre to put that logo on their plants as a marketing tool, as long as it's the right species of plant. Right, Okay. Regardless of what pesticides are in it. And Mm. we basically bought bee-friendly plants from all the main outlets around here, Y Vale and Mm. B&Q and so on. And 70% of them had insecticides in them, usually a whole cocktail of insecticides. And they're being sold to people on the basis that they will support insects in your garden and actually they're going to poison them, Mm. which strikes me as pretty outrageous. So one of the things we did when we were kind of raising the profile of this work and trying to put pressure on garden centres to stop was we contacted RHS and said, your logo is being used on these plants full of insecticides. You know, what are you going to do about it? Hoping that they would perhaps initiate some kind of work with garden centres to produce a range of genuinely bee-friendly plants that were guaranteed free of insecticide or something. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Mm. Basically, they kind of went completely silent for about 18 months. And then at the end of it, they changed it from perfect for pollinators to plants for pollinators. One bloody word. Essentially sidestepping the issue and saying, okay, we admit they're not perfect for pollinators. They might be full of poison, but they're plants for pollinators. And that was the sole thing they did. So they didn't do anything to help. They just tried to duck the issue by changing one bloody word. So I kind of lost respect for the RHS at that point. I didn't realise that they could put that tag in the plants as long as they were the right species, regardless of where they were grown. So they could be importing them from who knows where. They might not even know the supply chain and what's been used on that plant, the people that are buying it in. The whole system is opaque. If you go to a garden centre and say, I see you're selling this plant as being bee friendly. Can you tell me whether it's got any pesticides in it? They won't have the foggiest idea. They just got it from a wholesaler who got it from somewhere, probably not even in this country. An awful lot of them shipped in from the Netherlands where they're produced in vast glass houses with lots of chemicals. That information isn't attached to the plant. Once it's been shipped on, nobody knows. They just sell them. They don't care. They just want them to look nice so that people buy them. The whole thing stinks, really. It's pretty irresponsible. And it's also exploiting people. You know, it's basically taking the hard-earned money of well-meaning people who want to make their garden wildlife friendly and selling them poison plants, which Mm. ought to be illegal. I suspect it might even be illegal. I mean, I don't know what trading standards would make of that, but I haven't yet managed to get any interest in fighting it through legal avenues, but that's something that should be explored. I thought people might have the idea that they can buy these plants and the insecticides that have been used might wear off or wash off after a period of time at which point the plants will be okay. Is that true? It is true. The pesticides don't last forever. As the plant grows, they get diluted, but also they do break down. But it varies enormously between different types of pesticides. Some are gone within a few days, but some last for years. So the kind of most notorious ones are neonicotinoids, which thankfully most of them are now banned in Europe. But When we screened garden centre plants two years ago, the majority of them had neonicotinoids in them. And they last for certainly three or four years in declining amounts, you know. So if someone has already bought a plant or a whole garden full of plants from the garden centre in the last year or two, I wouldn't suggest they rip them all up. 
you might as well leave them in now because the most harm would have been done when they were fresh from the garden centre with the most pesticides in it. And it will decline and it will eventually disappear. But I would say don't buy any more unless you can find a garden centre that can guarantee they're pesticide-free. So there are organic garden centres. If you haven't got one locally, there are organic garden centres online. There's a really nice one called Rosie Bee that I buy stuff from. She's based in Oxfordshire. It's a little company that specialises in rearing bee-friendly plants all organically. So, you know, you can get hold of them. You don't have to go to Y Vale or one of the big chains. Or grow them yourself. It's much cheaper. Get a packet of seeds. The seeds of flowers, I don't think, are normally treated with anything. If there are little residues of pesticides by the time it's grown into a plant, it's probably not a serious issue. So, yeah, grow your own. All plants swap with friends and neighbours and that kind of thing much more sustainable, not only because of the pesticides, but if you think about it, people think that gardening is a green activity, don't they? You know, what could be more green than growing flowers and vegetables in your garden? But actually, many people's idea of gardening is they drive in their car in the spring to a big garden centre. They buy a whole boot full of annual bedding plants, which have been treated in loads of pesticides. They're sold in disposable plastic trays, probably grown in peat-based composts. Probably they'll buy a few bottles of pesticides while they're there. Maybe a statue or two and who knows what else from garden centres sell everything these days. And then they drive home and plant their bedding plants out. They flower for a few months. They don't attract any insects because they're intensively bred, hopeless, ugly things, in my view. There's nothing green about that as a way of gardening at all. I don't think many people really appreciate it. So gardening can be fantastic, but as some people practice it, it's an environmental disaster. For a lot of people, that would involve a lot of patience. It would involve seeing gardening as a long-term activity, which I think probably people aren't so good at nowadays. Or they move around, or they may not have the space to grow things from seed. The sense I got from reading your book is that you are genuinely saying that we need to slam the brakes on that hard now. We need to go, actually, do you know what, that's it. We can't be going to garden centres, filling up our trolley with 100 quid's worth of plants at the weekend. Lovely as that may be. I think we need to actually take it quite seriously and say, "Mm, that's not sustainable. Yeah, I study bumblebees and why they're declining. And that's where I kind of started. But I've got drawn into kind of the whole mess we're making of the environment as a result, because what's happening to bees is actually happening to everything. This kind of assault that we're making on the environment. We live on this amazing planet with all this beautiful wildlife and all these natural resources, and we're just squandering the whole thing in the most kind of bizarrely reckless and stupid way. Not just, obviously, by the way we garden, but in hundreds of different ways. But gardening seems to me one area where not only if it's done badly can it be harmful, but where there is potential to do lots of good and actually to try and help tackle some of these big environmental issues like declining insect populations and wildlife populations generally. And things like even climate change. If you garden in the right way, you can lock up carbon in your soil. And that also makes the soil more healthy and fertile. And so you can grow better flowers and vegetables and so on. So it's kind of good for everybody. But people need to know how to do that and they need to understand why it's important. And at the moment, there's just a lack of education, a lack of awareness about the seriousness of the kind of big environmental issues that we face. I don't know whether you'll know too much about this. It is a little bit off topic, but going back to the idea of seeds, I guess some of them are treated with fungicides, are they? Is that a problem? You wouldn't think a fungicide would be harmful to bees say but there is evidence that at least some fungicides are actually quite poisonous to bees and it's just emerged from a number of scientific studies in the last year or two that said i'm not really clear on exactly what is on most seeds if anything we know that when farmers buy seeds whatever it might be oilseed rape then that is commonly treated with fungicides and until recently was treated with neonicotinoid insecticides. That bit's now been banned, but they're still often treated with fungicides. And in the future, they may be treated with other types of insecticides and so on. And that's quite a big dose of pesticide that's stuck to the seed when the farmer sows it in the ground. And we know that that can be harmful because it gets into the soil, it gets into the nectar and pollen of the plant if it flowers and so on. When it comes to people's gardens, the seeds that you can buy from a garden centre, they're not labelled as having been treated generally. And so far as I'm aware, they're not deliberately coated in any kind of pesticide. I don't think they should need to be, and I hope they're not, but I honestly don't know. And there seems to be no legal requirement to tell us what's Mm. on those seeds. So it's a bit of a grey area. So it made me think if you were in any doubt, 
might be better to opt for organic seeds. Absolutely. The safest option is to get organic seeds and there are suppliers. They're not quite as easily obtained, but they're out there. And with the internet these days, anyone can track them down and buy organic Mm. flower and veg seeds if they want. So that goes back to my question, which was about the Soil Association label. So I've been speaking to a lot of people at trade shows and garden shows lately. A lot of people who don't have Soil Association approval have been saying to me, well, actually, you know, it's not worth the paper it's written on or it's expensive or it's not worth it because I know my stuff's organic, but I don't want to go through the paperwork. Do you know anything about that? I can understand where they're coming from. I think the Soil Association certification is worth the paper it's written on in the sense that they are pretty strict. If you adhere to their organic standards, there should be no pesticide residues in anything you're producing. But I completely agree that it's expensive. It's a big hurdle to small operations. It's fine if you're a, you know, a big scale organic farmer. Well, it's more affordable. But if you're a small horticulture operation or just producing plants to sell locally or whatever on a small scale, then it's too expensive. So there are lots of people producing pesticide-free products who aren't registered with the Soil Association. I mean, I suppose then you just have to take it on trust. To my mind, if someone, you know, has a a nursery and says they don't use any pesticides, I'm kind of inclined to believe them. Why would they lie? You know, it would be a strange thing to do. Usually these people are really well-meaning. You know, their heart is very much in the right place. They wouldn't dream of using any pesticides. And just because they can't afford the Soil Association certification, I don't think we should discriminate against them for that. Mm. It's worth paying attention to that labelling, but we shouldn't kind of dismiss everybody that can't afford it. So in your book, your new book, you also were talking about natives and non-native plants. I think you said that you weren't going to get to puritanical about using only natives you were saying you know the kind of pollinators and everything they'll still use the non-natives what I've been sort of looking into on the podcast a little bit is about the benefit of non-natives as host species so is there a kind of importance to include the natives as well as the non-natives from that perspective yeah so purely from the point of view of pollinators bees and all the other pollinating insects this weak evidence that they really care where the plants come from unless they're some really exotic hummingbird pollinated plant or bird pollinated plant from south america australia or whatever in which case it may well not be much use to european pollinators but most for example north american plants the insects that they've co-evolved with are mostly very similar to European plants. So there are lots of North American plants that are fantastic for pollinators and similarly plants from Asia and so on. So most native plants have associated herbivores, maybe caterpillars or butterflies or moths, or it may be shield bugs or any number of insects. There are far more species of insects that are herbivores than pollinators. And some plants, particularly bigger shrubs and trees, have hundreds of associated insects. If you didn't have any native trees and grew only exotic trees, which tend not to support many herbivores, there are some of our native insects that can switch on to feeding on weird and wonderful exotic shrubs and so on. But in general, if you grow something that's exotic, it'll support far fewer herbivorous insects than if it's native. If people are thinking, what can I plant in my garden? And they're looking for be it a baseous plant or a shrub or a tree then if they kind of at least checked out whether there was a native species that was suitable first, and if there isn't, you know, in a garden, I don't think you should be too puritanical and tell everyone they have to try and grow 100% native plants. For one, you're never going to get very far, you know. We're all far too accustomed to having beautiful, exotic plants in our gardens to persuade everyone to give them up. But there are lots of really nice native trees and shrubs and plants, beautiful wildflowers and so on that look nice, that are well suited to our conditions here because they're native, that will support pollinators and support a whole bunch of herbivores. So, you know, all else being equal, then, yeah, go for the natives when you can, but don't get completely hung up on it is my advice. Where could people find out about what species might be? It's quite hard. I mean, for some native plants, it's been well studied. So, for example... Oak trees, people have catalogued the insects associated with oak trees. And I I forget the precise total, but there's something like three or four hundred different species of insect associated with oaks. Of course, not everyone has room for an oak tree. They're pretty big, but I'm lucky I've got a couple. But if you do have room, you can guarantee you will support a whole bunch of biodiversity right there in your garden. For many native plants, there's no easily available kind of list of all the different creatures that will 
visit them. But you can pretty much guarantee that anything that's native will have associated wildlife 